Well, I remember as a young boy growing up in Minnesota, hearing my oldest brother's cry of a generation in the blaring stereo. And the words were of Jackie DeShannon. Whether you grew up in that generation or not, you know that these words are a part of the fabric of our lives. Now, I'm not going to sing them to you this morning. just want you to know. <laughs> but I know you know them. And I heard them as a young boy. What the world needs now is love, love sweet love. It's the only thing there's just too little of. Now, the cry here today is not just that cry, because the world always needs love, doesn't it? But the cry here today, everywhere I go as a pastor, is what the world needs now is job, sweet jobs. It's the only thing there's just too little of. <coughs> I hear it everywhere I go, friends. On a plane recently from Portland, that great city, to Kansas City, home of the Royals, um, <laughs> I had a conversation with two guys sitting next to me in the plane, and usually I'm kind of dead at that time. But I had a conversation with them, two brothers on their way to Arkansas, uh, visiting their retired father. And I struck up a conversation with them, two brothers, and the younger brother had just graduated from college a year ago. And as we talked, I asked him how things were going, and I'll never forget he looked at me, and I'm a stranger to him, you know? He doesn't know I'm a pastor or paid to be good or anything. Um, and uh, he said to me, you know, it's really brutal out there. And I said, what do you mean? He says, I've been looking for a year for a job, and I can't find it. I could tell by his sullen countenance and his language, he was really hurting. A gifted young man in the highlight of his life and a great promise ahead of him. And he was wrestling with not just the question I'm often asked is, how do I live life? But a new question I'm asked today by strangers and parishioners, is how do I make a living? I hear this everywhere I go. And recently, a parishioner of mine, uh, I serve in a wonderful congregation in Kansas City. It's a multi-site church. But this gentleman has been a part of our suburban congregation for a long time. Imagine with me meeting at Starbucks in the morning, as I do often, and uh, a, a guy who's, let's just say, like me, playing uh, in the back nine round of life, 55 years of age. He's definitely in the back nine, but his life is really challenging right now. He's a very gifted architect, phenomenally gifted, and with the downturn of the economy, he lost his job in a very prestigious firm. What do you do when you're 50 years old and lose your job and everything you're about? Well, he started his own firm, and uh, it was a hard entrepreneurial journey. I kept up with him, so we're having coffee, and I said, how are you doing? And with glistening eyes, 55 years of age, with two kids in college, he looked at me and said, Pastor Tom, this entrepreneurial journey has been brutal. He said, I have gone through all my savings to try to make cash flow, to make payroll. And he said, I don't think I can go on anymore. He said, I'm thinking, my wife and I have talked about me getting a job at Home Depot. Now, no seminary training has ever prepared me as a pastor. How do I respond to that? What do I say? Do I say, like James, go warm and be filled and be unemployed or underemployed? What do I do? The cry here across our nation and our globe, from Wall Street to Main Street, is jobs, sweet jobs. It's not just how do I live life, pastor, but how do I make a living? It's the cry of our day. And I want to say, as all of us who are a part of the faith and work movement, that perhaps the Sunday to Monday gap that we are trying to narrow is already still very wide. That rather than calling our movement that I am passionate about the F and W movement, perhaps it needs to be the FWE movement. That faith, work, and economics are a seamless fabric of gospel ministry. And we must press into this. I would suggest to you that some of the reason the gap is still so wide in our movement is because we have an impoverished understanding of one of Jesus' most important teachings. That teaching is known as a great commandment, but the gospel writer Luke sets it up, if you remember, in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, a, a religious scribe, an expert in the law, comes to Jesus and asks him about how he can in, uh, inherit eternal life. You remember the story. He's focused on eternity, but Jesus focuses on temporality in his response. And Jesus says to him, the whole summer of the Old Testament is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor is yourself. To which this gentleman says, okay, Jesus, come on, now who is my neighbor? And Jesus, rather than answering with a pat answer, he tells a powerful, paradigm-shattering story. 
A story so impregnated with contrast, it takes our breath away. Not only does Jesus answer the question, who is our neighbor? But Jesus answers the question of the day, what does neighborly love require? You know the story of the Good Samaritan. This is what Jesus says, or do you, or do I? You remember the story in Luke chapter 10. Luke captures the setup of the story as Jesus tells us there's a man who goes from Jerusalem down the ancient road near the Wadi Kilt to the King's Highway in Jericho. Jericho was a thriving economic center in the time, and this man is on his way down to Jericho. He is the victim of incredible violence and economic injustice. He is robbed. He's beaten by thugs. He's left for dead, and you know the story, paid to be good guys like me. Walk by him, a Levite, a priest. But then there's an unlikely character in the story, and you know him as the Samaritan. But if we understand the context, the Samaritan probably wasn't a man of the cloth. He was a man of business. He was making his way down from the center of the country to Jericho to accomplish some business entities that he had, most likely. And rather than walking by, you know, Samaritans were the outcasts. They were the who's that or the who's the, the, who of the day. There was great ethnic bias, prejudice, religious bigotry. And this Samaritan crosses all that. And he looks at this neighbor, most likely Jewish, and he sees this man through the eyes of God. And he expresses compassion, doesn't he? Amazing compassion. He binds his wounds. He puts him on his animal and he takes him to an inn. But we often stop there. And Jesus, Rabbi Jesus, continues the story. Why? Because the riveting contrast is not only about the Good Samaritan and his amazing compassion, it's also about the Good Samaritan's economic capacity. Because Jesus gives us two riveting, impregnated contrasts in the story that we miss. One is the contrast of the Good Samaritan crossing lines of bigotry and hatred to express compassion, but also the contrast between the thuggery and economic injustice of robbery to this man and the economic generosity and capacity of the Good Samaritan. In this story, we are given a profound truth for our day. A, a, a truth that we often miss, I feel, across the nation, in our movement, across our churches of the land, that we must address. And that is that neighborly love that God requires us, that the gospel compels us to, requires not only Christ-like compassion, but economic capacity. <coughs> in my own particular journey as a pastor for 10 years, I practiced truly pastoral malpractice. That I've perpetuated a Sunday to Monday gap in my parishioner's life, and it was founded in my own thinking, my own impoverished understanding of the biblical text and how the gospel, as we say, transforms all of life. It speaks into every nook and cranny of life. We say that, but do we live it? Do we indwell it? Do we believe the gospel transforms the work, the worker, the workplace, and speaks into the common good of all in powerful ways? I really believe that. So how do we begin to move forward in our faith and work and economics movement to be the neighbors God has called us to be on a global level? I want to suggest two areas that we must focus on, two threads in the fabric of faithfulness, of a faithful presence of God's people in his church in our broken world when the cry is for jobs. The first is this. We must embrace a more robust theology that speaks into all of life and speaks into the value of common grace for the common good. Now, there's much we could say here, but Wendell Berry has certainly shaped much of my thinking, this wonderful writer. In a little book that is power-packed, the book called The Art of the Commonplace, Wendell Berry says this, that the quality and significance of our work is determined by the story in which we find ourselves. And this is true in all our lives that we must grasp the rich narrative of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, the fullness of creation, fall, redemption, and consummation, and the central thread of the gospel. We must have a theological vision that sustains us and moves us forward. And we must spend a significant time in the beginning of the story. In Genesis chapter 1, we see the framework of this story, and we must not miss it. That is, that we have a God who works, a God who introduces himself as a working God. And he creates us in his image. And in Genesis 1.28, we are given this cultural mandate 
This cultural mandate we often miss to be fruitful and multiply is his image bearers, and it's the Hebrew word para. And this Hebrew word para sets the trajectory of the whole storyline. And that is that para is to be both productive and procreative. So when we get to Genesis chapter 2, this para is seen fully in Adam being placed in the garden to cultivate and to keep it, but he can't do it alone. He can't accomplish para. He can't be procreative and productive. He is alone and it's not good. So what does God do? He creates Eve, Ezra, his helper, to accomplish the cultural mandate of God's design for human flourishing of both procreativity, fruitfulness, and productivity. But then we know in Genesis 3 what happens, don't we? In Genesis 3, what was integral design becomes massive disintegration. And para is distorted and corrupted both procreativity and productivity. Isn't that interesting that you see this in Genesis 3 if you look at what the text says, that both in childbirth, procreativity, both in working of our hands, the thorns and the thistles, para is corrupted. But God does not leave us there, amen? God has a redemptive plan. The gospel begins to be unveiled through the carpenter of Nazareth who has holy sweat on his brow and sawdust on his hands that would be spread out on the cross as an atoning sacrifice for you and me. The grand story has a redemptive element that calls us to transformation of our life and the common good and takes us from individual contribution to mutual collaboration for the common good. This is the fundamental basis of economics and exchanging value with one another. This is God's design and desire for us and the common good. We must have a more theologically rich vision. But we also must promote human flourishing as it relates to economic flourishing. There are many things we could say here, but we need to teach economic wisdom to our people. The Bible does not give us some economic theory of capitalism or socialism, but it gives us principles that guide us for human flourishing, how God designed us. The Spirit of God gives us the fruit of the Spirit to give us virtue in our work for the common good, and it gives us a hopeful realism to deal with the messy, messiness of an already not yet world. We must embrace and teach our people economic wisdom and scripture. Many things come from scripture here. We must teach the value of private property, personal incentive, hard work. We must address law. We must address economic injustice and systemic injustice and the importance of stable currency and good monetary value and systems. This is what we are called to do. But we also must, as local churches, think through our mission. At Christ Community, we are involved with many areas of job creation, entrepreneurship, helping underemployed, helping our city, under-resourced people. We have conferences called Common Good, where the common good we emphasize with business leaders and education leaders and pastors who come together for the common good of the city. Our next Common Good conversation will be 2015. It is called Economic Shalom for the Common Good of our city. Isn't that amazing? This is at the heart of our mission. We are also helping pastors reshape their paradigm and practices and priorities to be faithful pastors to connect Sunday to Monday. We're teaching our pastors basic economic principles and wisdom, and we're helping them think through spiritual formation and pastoral care and mission. We must, we must connect Sunday to Monday, not only with individual contribution, but mutual collaboration. The gospel compels us to this for the common good of all. What the world needs now, friends, what the world needs now is the gospel. What the world needs now is love, sweet love, huh? It's the only thing there's just not enough of. Not just for some, but for everyone. But what the world is crying out for is the neighborly love Jesus calls you and me to live. A neighborly love that involves Christ-like compassion for the poor, the needy, all people, but economic capacity that allows us to be generous. Paul says this in Ephesians 4.28, let him who steals, steal no longer. But let him work with his hands, do honest work, and notice the text, so that they may have opportunity to help those in need. How can we have the blessing, everybody, that it's more blessed to give than to receive, unless we have something to give? Neighborly love involves both a tender Christ-like compassion for all of our neighbors, but it also involves economic capacity. What the world needs now is jobs, sweet jobs. What will our response be? 
We have an opportunity. <clears throat> Where the church is marginalized, the door is opening right here while we walk through it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Now, you know nobody gets off this stage without submitting to interrogation. So suppose... Greg asked tough questions, too. <laughs> Uh, well, this one will be uh, this this one will be doable. Um, suppose uh, I'm a pastor or a, a lay leader or or other kind of leader in a local church, uh, and we've started to get on top of faith and work, and we're we're challenged by this idea of the common good, economic wisdom, sort of stretch. What would be some first steps or some low hanging fruit, some tangible things we might do to you know to get off the blocks on that? One of the suggestions I have is that we begin to help our elders, our leaders, our congregant leaders, and our pastors begin to have greater economic capacity and competency. Many of us do not have that background. We need the theological on-ramp so it makes sense to us. So we start with theology, but we need to help have a greater competency among our clergy, among our current leaders. For example, at Christ Community, again, we're just stumbling along. Um, our leaders are reading Economic Shalom by John, John Bolt. That is a part of our curriculum to help us understand economics and the common good from our tradition.